All right. Uh, so at this point, uh, Anna, you want to take it for the presentation? Sure. If you guys are ready, see if I can make this work, you know, working computers all the time. I feel like I'm becoming like my father sometimes who was a computer programmer, but couldn't figure out where, how to work the VCR when I was a kid. So, you know, this yeah. newfangled stuff. So I hope everybody can share, see my uh, screen okay. Um, for those folks that uh, don't know me, I'm Annalise McDermott. You can call me Anna. Um, I've been a ham since about 1987, where I was uh, uh, a novice in the Crescent Valley High School Amateur Radio Club and the president of that amateur radio club for a while. So I've been doing this for a while, but I've been a, uh, uh, doing computers for even longer. I started programming when I was about five year old in kindergarten with uh, Apple Basic and learned C when I was in sixth grade and uh, have been programming ever since. I've spent most of my career doing systems and network administration on Unix-like boxes, so Unix and Linux and things like that. Um, back in the late 90s, I built the, the, the operating system and computers that ran Disney.com. Um, and a few other things like that. So been doing this for a long time. Um, I've also been doing uh, interested in software defined radio for about 15 years now. Um, I've written a couple different software defined radio apps for some open source software defined radio platforms for the Mac and the iPad um, and did some pioneering work on that. I was one of the first programs that uh, had a waterfall display that that was written in OpenGL. So been doing this for a while. I currently am uh, employed by Flex Radio Systems as a software engineer. Um, so I am uh, write pieces of the software that any of you Flex Radio users use every day when you get releases. So I mainly do a lot of the release engineering and stuff like that. So um, just to kind of a point of order with my presentations, I don't mind questions in the middle. So if you have something that you are curious about that you wanna interrupt me, don't really worry about it too much. I don't mind uh, uh, being interrupted. Um, I, I may uh, put you off towards the end so that we can uh, get, get through the presentation and not get um, too far derailed because I have a tendency to do that. Um, also remember that I am not an electrical engineer or a computer scientist. My degree is in uh, my degrees are in uh, political science and law. Um, so don't ask me too much about uh, the math behind some of this stuff that goes on or to do derivatives off the top of my head because that ain't gonna happen. So. Anyway, this is my introduction to software defined radio because I don't know the math so well we're going to try and keep it to a minimum and uh, when we do we're going to try and show some pictures in order to give some uh, alternative uh, views of what's going on. Um, so what is software defined radio to start out with. I kind of like to view it as digital signal signal processing with extreme prejudice. Um, and what does that mean? That means we employ digital signal processing for everything. A um, I define it as a system where components typically implemented in hardware are done in software. So where one day you might have uh, done AM mod demodulation with inductors and capacitors and crystals and things like that, we now do it in software with math. Typically, a test of whether you have a software-defined radio in an amateur radio is asking yourself where the demodulation is performed. If the demodulation is performed in the analog realm, you typically do not have a software-defined radio, even if you do have a whole bunch of digital signal processing connected to it. An example of that might be in uh, ICOM IC756 Pro, which has a lot of DNS DSP filters and everything like, like that on it, but really it's a super heterodyne receiver where all the DSP is done after the demodulator. And we'll talk a little bit later about why that really makes a difference in what we're trying to do here. Hey, Anna, real quick. Sure. N not to derail what you're doing, but I happen yep. to have an IC7300. Uh -huh. Could you talk about that hybrid approach to SDR? Uh, we will be talking about the 7300 uh, a little bit later when we talk about um, there will be a whole set of slides uh, going over software defined radio architectures and what you'll see out there. Um, and we'll be talking about the 7300 in there. Thank you. Um, another point is computers don't make it SDR. Um, that uh, used to be a bigger problem with people in the past, but uh, it is still a mistake that people made. 
CAT is software controlled radio, not software defined radio. Just because you have an ethernet that you can control what your frequency is in, or you're on a USB where you can change the frequency or transmitter, that doesn't make it a software defined radio. That's a software controlled radio. The big one that I always heard about in the olden days that some of you might recognize and some of you might not is the Kachina 505. That was one that had like all these nice displays that you could put on your PC and you can control it and it really didn't have a front panel. Everything was done over your PC, but it is a software controlled radio. It is an analog radio where all the controls were done digitally over a serial port. Merely replacing the front panel with a TFT screen doesn't make it SDR. Again, like a 756 Pro had a nice uh, TFT screen on it that did a lot of displays, but it's not a software-defined radio. Conversely, the Elecraft K3 and KX3 and the ICOM 7300 are SDRs. Just because it doesn't have a computer associated with it doesn't mean it's not an SDR. Um, there's a lot of embedded systems that are increasingly able, and, and especially these days. Um, I originally wrote this presentation for Seaside around 10 years ago, and uh, processing power on embedded systems has just gone up and up and up. Um, and you're going to be able to do some amazing DSP processing with embedded systems these days, where you don't necessarily see the computer, it's sitting there in the background. Um, incidentally, the new K4 is also an SDR. It actually is running Ubuntu Linux inside of it. So let's talk about some basic SDR concepts. And this is where we get into some of the vaguely mathy stuff, but these are stuff that import, it's important for understanding how an SDR works. And you will hear a lot about I and Q um, when you hear people talking about te the technical side of software-defined radio. I and Q are a way of decomposing and looking at the signals that you are getting in at your antenna terminal in order to be able to analyze them with math. I is the magnitude of the in-phase component of the signal. So that's the standard in-phase component that you're going to get when you demodulate all the signal. But in order to represent phase changes, you also want the magnitude of the quadrature signal. That's what Q stands for, or that is the signal that is 90 degrees out of phase with it. So with I and Q, you can do a lot of math and you can represent any signal that possibly hits your antenna terminal. Like I said, given the reference frequency and I and Q, any signal you want can be represented. We usually represent these with complex numbers. So I is the real part of your complex number and Q is the imaginary part for those of you from uh, your math classes that remember complex numbers. So we represent them as uh, I is real and Q is imaginary. And what you can do with those that's helpful to visualize is you can imagine them graphed out with I on the X axis and Q on the Y axis. And you can see where the signal is. And what this allows you to do is the length of this vector is the amplitude of the signal and the angle compared to I is the phase. So you can do uh, phase and amplitude of any signal. If I wanted to do an AM receiver, what I would do is I would use Pythag the Pythagorean theorem and I would use it on I and Q. So I squared plus Q squared and the square root of that would give me the length of this vector here. And that represents the magnitude of the signal. The magnitude of the signal represents what I'm trying to decode in AM. So all I have to do in order to implement an AM receiver given I and Q is run the Pythagorean theorem over every set of IQ samples that I get. It's that easy, really. The math isn't that hard behind it. We are just doing it at, you know, at least 24,000 samples a second in order to provide that signal. Another important concept in software defined radio is time versus frequency domain, because we want to look at signals in both time and frequency domain. What exactly does that mean? It's really just two different ways of looking at the same signal you're getting in at your antenna terminal. Time domain should be really familiar to you. 
Uh, it looks at varying characteristics over time. So specifically for us, the voltage at the antenna terminal over the time that you get it. So that's what generally comes in raw off of your analog to digital converter, because once every one, you know, uh, say 48 thousandth of a second, we sample the voltage at the antenna terminal, figure out what the voltage is. We can graph those over time and get sine wave or whatever wave is coming in. That's looking at something from the time domain. But we can also look at it from the frequency domain. And that looks at the whole signal, but tells me what the frequency components are. So if you have a one kilohertz sine wave overlaid on a 50 hertz sine wave, um, then I can look at them and see and bust out what the one kilohertz um, amplitude is versus the um, 50 hertz amplitude. Usually we're looking at the signal amplitude or power when we're looking at the time domain. Sometimes power is easier to do, especially since remember the Pythagorean theorem that we talked out about before, power is gonna be related to the square. So that lets us do some nasty math tricks where we don't bother to take the square root of a squared plus b squared because it's harder for a computer to do. And we just consider it's the power. Another way to think about time versus frequency domain is the ADC gives you samples in the time domain. An oscilloscope is a time domain device. So you are looking at your, say if you hook an oscilloscope up to your input, you are looking at the signal in the time domain because it graphs the voltage of the signal versus the time of the sweep. So an oscilloscope is a time domain device. And you see my old oscilloscope here with its, you know, great CRT monitor and the highest technology Hewlett Packard had to offer in 1990. A spectrum analyzer is a frequency domain device. You are looking at the frequency on the uh, X axis and the magnitude or, or the power of that on the Y axis. So you can break down the same signal. You can put a splitter on your signal coming in and put one into the splitter on the oscilloscope and put one into the splitter on the, the spectrum analyzer. And you can look at the same stuff in different ways. And that becomes really important for the stuff that we do with SDR. What pulls both of these together. And this is the most mathy part of the presentation. So stay with me here. This looks confusing now, but this is a video. So that should become pretty um, apparent to you when you look at it is what's called the fast Fourier transformation. I am a lawyer. Do not ask me how to do a DFT by hand. I have no clue how to do a DFT. A DFT is a black box for me that I put some signal in at the time domain and I get frequency domain out of it. And that's all I need to know because there's some really smart math people that have made libraries on my computer that will do all the work for me. And I don't really have to understand how it works. So thank you for you your humility, Anna. Thank you for your humility. <laughs> yes, yes. But what you're, gonna see, the answers. what you're going to see in this video is um, along the top here. Let me see if I can get a little annotation here. There we go. Uh, draw. Yeah, that's good enough. So up here is going to be a set of two signals. You've got the red signal and the blue signal. And you're going to see those red and blue signals doing different things at different times. This display is the red signal plus the blue signal. So you can see in even the static picture here how you're seeing the red signal superposed, uh, superimposed on the blue signal. If you put these two tones into your microphone, this was what get, would get transmitted out the transmitter essentially. And then down here is the fast Fourier transformation of both of those signals where you'll see frequency along the X axis and the magnitude along the Y. So let me see if I can actually get this, uh, get this video going here because you will see maybe supposed to be, there we go. So you see that we have just a sine wave with uh, on the blue one with the red one just being zero. We're doing nothing with it. And you see that's a 50 hertz sine wave because the FFT at the bottom shows that 50 hertz magnitude going up. And notice that the magnitude is at one. 
So it's showing you that one is there. Now on that 50 megahertz signal, we're superimposing an 100 hertz signal. So you can see how they add together and you can see on the FFT on the bottom, how now we're getting um, a larger 100 hertz signal because notice the 100 hertz signal is bigger magnitude. Now we can vary the frequency of that 100 hertz signal to be 200 and you can see how the uh, FFT is changing at the bottom and you're starting to see the 200 megahertz or the 200 hertz bin come up. The next one should be what if the other signal is just a DC offset, right? Well, how do, what's DC? DC is zero hertz. So you're seeing the zero hertz on the complete left um, represent that. So that's how you know there's a DC offset on your signal is you can look at the zero hertz line. And this is back to the start where we have the 50 hertz signal alone without the anything superimposed on it. So you can see how just by doing math, that's just an FFT there, that's just doing math with all those signals, we can move things from the frequency domain into the time domain or from the time domain into the frequency domain. There is also, which is important, an inverse fast Fourier transformation where we can take the fast Fourier bins that we got and we can reverse them and we can come up with a time signal again. That is important because one of the things that we do a lot is a filter. So how we can implement a filter in SDR is if we take the fast Fourier transformation and we end up with a picture like this, where we've got a whole bunch of you know frequency bins, doesn't really matter each which one of them, and different amplitudes of a real signal that came in. All we need to do is pick a cutoff frequency somewhere. If we chop off the end and then do an inverse FFT, we will have filtered the signal as a low pass filter that is lower than the cutoff frequency. Mathematically, we can do that by multiplying all of those FFT bins by one for the signals we want and zero for the signals we don't. So we can do that in blocks and we filter our signal that way. And notice that um, what we get in that, that spectrum is really a very, very severe a low pass filter. The, um, the skirts on that thing are not very wide at all and are really limited not by the math, but on the computer's ability to do the math and the precision. Rounding error is big in software-defined radio. So that's how you construct a filter in software-defined radio. I also wanted to talk a little bit because you start to hear more about the Nyquist rate these days. Um, the Nyquist rate says that for if you want to sample a particular frequency, you need a sampling frequency equal to twice that frequency in order to sample it. So for example, if you want to sa accurately sample a 10 megahertz signal, you must sample that signal at at least 20 mega samples per second. This is one of the things, the reason I bring it up is this is one of the things that can determine the performance of your SDR. Consider an anon radio, an open SDR based radio. That ADC in there is an 122.88 mega sample per second converter. That means the best case that it can do is frequencies from zero to 61.44 megahertz. So the ADC speed tends to um, affect that because it affects the maximum signal that you can sample. The good thing about an SDR like that is an 122.88 megasample per second ADC only sees up to 61.44 megahertz, but it sees everything from zero to 61.44 megahertz all at the same time. It captures every single signal from DC to six meters. If you only have the wherewithal to process all that data. For reference, I calculated it out once and that analog to digital converter would completely fill two gigabit ethernet connections if you're doing 
122.88 at 16 bits, so two bytes of sampling. So you need a lot of bandwidth to, you know, to get it into the processor, and you need some compute power, some significant compute power to be able to process all that stuff. And you have the little lawyer's disclaimer at the bottom. I know that this is a simplified explanation of the Nyquist rate and there are equal <laughs> sample periods. This is an intro, not a doctoral thesis. So, um, and my doctor isn't in this. My doctorate is a joke doctorate. So your mileage may vary. If you wanna argue with me about it after, I will gladly defer to your uh, in electrical engineering and mathematics expertise. You know, I have to say this in Corvallis because, you know, I encounter way too many, you know, surprise professors or whatever, where I'm talking to them and, you know, the lawyer's trying to sound important. They're like, oh yeah, my last name is Nyquist. It's like, yeah, okay, whatever, dude. <laughs> so anyway, <laughs> other simple software components. Oscillators. How do I build an oscillator in an SDR? I don't have any crystals or anything like that. We build what's called a numerically controlled oscillator. It's not a voltage controlled oscillator. It's not a crystal oscillator. It's a numerically controlled oscillator. What is it? Amplitudes times sine theta. <laughs> it's not hard to create. The computer has a sine function. You can use it. All you do is you advance the, the phase of the signal in a loop and you create it mathematically. You can do a mixer in software-defined radio. Well, how, how do I do a mixer? It's multiplication in the time domain. If you multiply two signals together in the time domain, you will mix them together. So we end up doing a lot of uh, numerically controlled oscillators into a mixer. So we take the output of the NCO, we multiply it by the samples coming in, and that's an oscillator and mixer in order to do a down conversion inside of the software-defined radio. So now that I've dazzled you with my amazing mathematical skills, why the hell would we do this in the first place when you can just get some simple resistors and capacitors to do it for you? And we've been doing that for years and we know how they work. Performance. Software-defined radio math does not depend on whether it's zero degrees out or 100, and zero, 100 degrees out. Two plus two is always equal to four in the computer. Um, so components do not vary whether they're heated. P components do not vary whether they're old or new or not. Um, math doesn't wear out. Two plus two is, is going to be four today, um, just like it was 20 years ago. So the performance of an SDR is pretty amazing, um, especially on like filter sharpness and things like that. Um, because you don't have to worry about a lot of things that uh, you have to worry about in the analog domain. And really, the, the performance of an SDR um, can largely be determined by rounding error. Rounding error tends to be a lot of our problem and making sure that we don't compound that. So the performance of SDRs is really, really awesome. Flexibility. Because it's a software-defined radio and it really uses the same hardware to do everything, if I want to implement a new modulation mode, it's a software upgrade. I write software, I can give it to people, they can download it onto their computer and go. This is one of the reasons why the Air Force is very interested in the Flex Radio um, uh, product is because we have something called the Waveform API where you can create new waveforms for the radio and upload them um, after the radio has been built and, uh, and uh, be able to do that. Um, that's something you can't do very easy with a hardware defined radio. Um, if you have an old Collins from the seventies, um, it's pretty hard to add FM to it if FM didn't exist on it to start out with. Um, since this is all software, you can upgrade your flex radio with whatever the newest range of modulations comes in um, and uh, make that work. New capabilities that we haven't even thought about yet. Um, a lot of analog radios didn't have a lot of the nice eye candy that we see now that really helps out. Um, things like waterfall displays and, uh, and uh, uh, spectrum displays that we just didn't have before. Those are new capabilities. Um, being able to have you know, wideband sort of uh, data modes that uh, weren't possible with analog radios because we're doing them all in software. 
Um, and believe me, we're having run November sweepstakes a few times with uh, my Flex Radio. I greatly prefer to look into the signals on my display um, to try and define them by uh, flipping the dial around. So um, there are a lot of new capabilities you get with SDR. And something I'm labeling social aspects. And this is kind of going to be your sermon for this evening. Um, I've been doing this, as I've said uh, quite a few times, I've been doing this for a while. And uh, when I gave one of my first presentations about the OpenHP SDR project and the work that I did on that to the MicroHams con uh, conference at uh, Microsoft campus in Redmond, um, that's the Microsoft Amateur Radio Club does a, a show every year where they have speakers and stuff like that. There were a few high school kids there that had come to present their project as one of the presentations, and um, they were coming to uh, the demonstration that I had set up at the table after I had given my speech. And the older guys, you know, more my age and, you know, well, most of Hamden's age would come up to my display and they would ask me about the silver box that was hooked up to my computer. What's inside that thing? What ADC does it use? Does it have an FPGA inside? What filtering is on there? Blah, blah, blah. Um, and that was what they were fascinated about and interested in. The 18 year olds that gave the presentation didn't ask anything about the silver box. They could care less about what was in the silver box. They wanted to know what language the software was written in. They wanted to know whether it was open source. They wanted to know whether it ran on Linux. They wanted to know whether the source code was out there so that they could play with it. And the reason that I bring this up in social aspects is I firmly believe that one of the reasons of why SDR is to get young blood interested in the technical aspects of ham radio. There are a lot of kids there that because of the rise of the internet, they don't care about getting on a two meter repeater and rag chewing with their friends. That's not cool. Um, but creating a radio out of software that receives stuff from overseas or whatever, or that they can play around with a new modulation mode that uh, they're able to do, that's huge. And in ham radio, we have an asset that is priceless and unique in the fact that we are, and this is, I'm speaking as a lawyer, we are the only radio service that I am aware of that we are allowed to build and put a radio on the air without involving the FCC at all. Commercial companies have to ask the FCC for permission or have to ask for an ex uh, experimental license. When they create the rig, they have to send it for certification. We have to do none of that to put a radio on the air. And that is huge for kids and younger people and, you know, even college professors and things like that, that want to experiment and play with this stuff and see what it reacts like on real frequencies. We have the capability to do that with our licenses and it's amazing. Um, and that's something that we should never lose about ham radio. Um, and I think that's a part of what SDR and our moving towards SDR brings is this sort of interest from a younger and different audience than may have traditionally been interested in ham radio. Um, and Excellent some, point. And some of the MCOM people are going to have to deal with the fact that while I love you know MCOM and the idea that I can do that, my interest in ham radio is more on the technical arts. And there are going to be a lot of people that will enrich the hobby um, that will be in the same boat. So anyway, there's your sermon for this evening. And here, Paul, is where we'll talk about some of the SDR architectures that you commonly see out there um, today. Um, the first one is the super heterodyne SDR which is really a two, typical super heterodyne uh, design, um, but the ADC samples in the intermediate frequency in order to do the demodulation and everything like that. The typical one that you see is an Elecraft K3. An Elecraft K3 has a first mixer on it and I believe a second mixer. So it mixes things down. Um, just like your normal rig would do. Um, it doesn't do the demodulation in hardware, uh, um, but it, uh, it does pretty much everything else. So they sample the signal at the, at, the, uh, uh, at the IF and then do the demodulation that way. Oh, I moved over that a little bit too quickly. There we go. So here's a block diagram of the Elecraft um, K3 where you see the second, first IF and the second IF. 
and it is all the way, where is my uh, draw? It is all the way down here that you see the analog to digital converters. With all of this analog stuff in here before you get to the ADC. So for me, as like the SDR and digital junkie, uh, we got all this analog stuff here to corrupt my pristine signal that I want to get into my analog to digital converters. So that's kind of your first kind of SDR architecture. The second SDR architecture, and kind of how I'm going through here is also going through generations, right? So we started out with the first generation architectures were the uh, uh, the um, uh, the superhead architectures, uh, partially because we could use cheaper analog to digital converters in those because they don't have to be as as performance sensitive because we're using all that analog circuitry to make things easier. That's kind of the same story with direct conversion. Direct conversion uses an analog mixer and a local oscillator to produce the I and Q signals for you. Note that unlike a super heterodyne SDR, signals are brought directly to baseband. There's no intermediate frequency. So you go directly from, you know, th you know for a, a 20 megahertz signal, you mix it directly down from 14 megahertz to baseband at zero megahertz, right? Examples of this are the soft rock, uh, which we'll talk about a little bit for those that might not be familiar. The Flex 5000 series, so our older radios that we made in the early to mid 2000s. The Elecraft KX3 is a uh, direct conversion SDR. Um, and uh, the RTL SDR that many of you may have played with is also a direct conversion SDR. Now, why is the RTL SDR direct conversion? A lot, well, the reason a lot of these are um, direct conversion, because again, because the ADC can be a lot simpler and a lot cheaper in these. It doesn't have to be as wide in order to get the signal where you want it to be. So again, I keep doing that. Don't do this. There we go. There's a block diagram of a direct conversion. You can see that uh, that I paused sharing. How did I do that? There we go. Resume share. Um, you can see that uh, draw. You have a band pass filter to limit some of the frequencies coming in, and then you have two mixers. One is for sine and the other is for cosine. So sine is I signals and cosine is 90 degrees out of phase. So those are the Q signals. And you use these mixers here to low pass frequency filters that go into the analog to digital converters. So you can see how now we've simplified the whole analog path a whole lot with these. So some examples, the soft rock is a really, really simple and really cheap SDR. Uh, it was designed by Tony Parks. You can get them at five dash.com and they're relatively inexpensive. They're as cheap as $21. And they use your computer's sound card as an ADC and, and DAC. So these are both receivers and transmitters. Um, you see along the left-hand side of the card that there are uh, a bunch of analog connections. Those are where your sound card goes in. And then there's an antenna connector at the bottom that goes with your antenna. And that's one of the reasons why the direct conversion um, architecture was so popular for a while, because you could use any cheap sound card that came as a part of your computer to do it. Another one is the RTL SDR. Um, which is just an ATSC TV tuner chip that some um, intrepid ham or other radio enthusiast um, found out had I and Q out, digital I and Q out over the uh, USB port. So it's mostly useful for VHF and UHF, but people have hacked the filtering on it in order to be able to do HF. They're available for around 30 bucks on Amazon. And, and one of the... Yeah, the, the new version three that you show a picture of there, you don't have to hack it to do HF. They built yeah. that. In. Um, I am an SDR snob, 
These are horrible receivers on HF, but they allow you to do, you know, uh, about what uh, they're uh, cheap and, and useful in certain cases. Um, but uh, one of their big deals is that the ADC inside of them is only an 8-bit ADC, and that is not a very high-performance ADC. So one of the reasons why this is a um, direct down conversion um, SDR is because at VHF and UHF right now, it is pretty difficult to get the next um, architecture we're going to talk about, which is direct sampling, um, to work because you need very high speed ADC to be A to D converters, and they tend to be very expensive to get that, um, that highest speed A, A to D converter, like literally thousands of dollars just for the ADC chip. Um, that's practical when we're selling military radios where the government will pay whatever we wanna ask for it. Um, but for the ham that thinks that our $7,000 Flex 6700 is like um, way too expensive, um, yeah, there, there, it could be worse. <clears throat> um, but don't get me wrong, the RTL SDR is a really great way to start playing with SDR for really cheap and get your feet wet and figure out what it's all about. Um, there are open source components that you can hack on this thing with, including GNU Radio, which is kind of a software defined radio toolkit um, that you can play around with the RTL SDR. And it's a great way to get started for cheap. I have like about five of them sitting in a drawer for various uses and abuses at different points in time. Um, there are cool stuff you can do with them with uh, aircraft tracking with, with ADS, where you can put an antenna and cheap out there. It's a good way to, because it's got a pretty wide bandwidth on its ADC, it's a pretty good way to make a um, quote unquote scanner um, where you can see all the repeater frequencies at once and just pick them out as you want them. So don't get me wrong. This is not a bad SDR. It is just not a great performer on the HF bands, like if you're wanting to do it for real. And I will note that I am an SDR snob. I have three flex radios here because uh, I got them for free. So that kind of colors my view on, on what's an expensive SDR and what's not. Um, so take that what you, for what you will. The final SDR architecture and what you see in most of the higher performance radios today is a direct sampling architecture. INQ signals are generated digitally. There's no analog mixer. Um, in a direct sampling system, your antenna is pretty much hooked directly to the input of your analog to digital converter. You only have a low pass frequency uh, filter required between the ADC and the antenna. Um, that's mainly because of that Nyquist frequency and what's called aliasing. So you need a filter that keeps all your signals below the Nyquist frequency of the analog to digital converter you're talking about. And I do, I'm only talking about ADCs here in the receive side of things. 99.9% um, .9 of this stuff also applies for the transmission side. Sometimes you have an analog preamp there in order to prescale some of the signals um, to be able to be within the uh, uh, sweet spot of the ADC. Examples of this are all the Apache Labs rigs or direct sampling receivers. All of the Flex 6000 rigs are direct sampling receivers. And the new ICOM IC7300 is actually a direct sampling SDR inside of there. This is an example of the um, block diagram of a direct sampling SDR. You can see in here, if I can draw again, there we go. So in here is the RF input and you go to a little preamp like I was talking about. And then this is the analog to digital converter right here. So you can see we went from the super hat where we had tons and tons and tons of analog stuff before we ever got to the ADC to be able to see things to I have a coax connector and a low pass filter or a, a preamp before I get to the ADC. And that's it. All of this on the back end is digital. A lot of the times in direct sampling receivers, you will see this is a common architecture. I don't think I've seen an architecture that isn't this, but there's an FPGA back here in order to um, do all the heavy calculations to get it into a format that your computer can understand a little bit better mostly to make the data rate lower so that you don't overwhelm the CPU. 
So that's most of your modern architectures today you're going to see as direct sampling. Um, and it is just mainly so that we can, the performance of a direct sampling receiver is real good. So uh, I'm going to take a little bit of a detour from questions to show folks kind of what, uh, where is the other window? Um, what this looks like when we put it all together. Where is my, I want to do, let me see if I can share the right screen here. All right, let me see if I can do it this way. Let's do it this way. We'll move these guys over here. Sorry about the uh, shuffling around here. Uh, we will do this top one. Sure. And you should be able to see um, two pan adapters on here. This is running on my computer against a Flex Radio Systems Flex 6700. So you can see that one of the things I can do is that on the same antenna coming in and the same data stream, these are both processed off the exact same data stream coming off the exact same analog digital converter. I'm looking at a chunk of 80 meters and a chunk of 40 meters at the same time. Each one of those has a receiver that I could turn the audio on. You can see the little flags here. Um, and to listen to at any one particular point in time. But let's say that two receivers is enough because that's, you know, kind of yesterday. And I could do that in the 70s with some of the high performance analog. I can click a button here and add a receiver on 40 meters and move it to listening to a different signal as I scroll across the bands. Well, three is cool. What if I want another one on 80? Well, I hit a button and I've got another one on 80. So I am now listening to four different frequencies at the same time off of the same antenna using the same data stream. This radio, particular radio, I can do, uh, we call these slices in flex radio um, terminology. I can do up to eight different slices at the same time at the same data stream. So think about that. I could leave at night and I'm going to, yeah, I'm working up a presentation for a couple of uh, uh, different conferences where I actually show you this. I could work up a software configuration here on my Mac where I could listen to FT8 on eight bands at the same time and decode every single one of them with the same data stream off of the same antenna, off of the same radio. We also do creative things with SDR where um, I am the only user on this radio right now, um, but you could have somebody log into the radio um, from another complete uh, other computer or one of our maestros, and I can have two people run the same radio at the same time. So they can be running two of the slices on their radio, um, and I could be running two of the slices on mine, and we could be listening to completely different stuff. Um, and the pan adapters are also similarly configurable. So I could, um, well, let's show you. If I go here, I can go create new pan adapter. And now I've got a new pan adapter. And let's say I want to see what's going on on uh, 20 meters. So I can uh, go to band 20 meters. And now the receiver is looking at 20 meters, 80 meters, and uh, 40 meters all at the same time with two, three, four, five receivers running across both of those bands. So these are the kinds of capabilities that SDR provides that is really difficult to do on an, on an analog radio. Um, and this is all done with math. So all of this is samples coming into that ADC. These waterfall displays are all created using the fast Fourier transformation that I talked to you about. That's how all of those graphics are done. The uh, pan adapter is done the same way. We calculate all of those using fast Fourier transformations in order to provide it uh, that information. 
Um, all of the demodulation is done using filtering um, and the Pythagorean theorem. So if I had the volume turned up, you would be able to hear those things um, and, uh, and, and get those. Uh, and that's all math. This is all done using all the stuff that I just explained to you. So at this point in time, I'm going to take questions and also remind you that uh, I'm a lawyer. I'm not an electrical engineer. So be easy on me on, on some of the stuff and uh, I will explain the best I can. Anybody or has it gone completely over your head? Mike always berates me when I get done with these things because I go entirely into too much detail. But Scott, do you have a question? Uh, yeah. Um, okay. So if you're using a FPGA versus a, I always wanted to know um, if a FPGA is actually faster than a, if you use a microprocessor. For instance, if you used a uh, embedded, um, I don't know, something like a pig. Um, Oh yeah, there's no way a PIC could handle that data rate. The reason why we use an FPGA um, is because, as I said, with an 122.88 mega sample converter at 16 bits per sample, you're talking two gigabits worth of data that's coming in. There aren't a lot of processors that can process that two gigabits worth of data um, and do it in a quick enough fashion to do it in real time. So what we use the FPGA for many times is that we will um, bring down the data rate. So uh, we only look at certain swaths of the bandwidth. So we will take the, uh, the samples we're getting in and we'll filter them down so that we only, only get like 192K <clears throat> of bandwidth, right? Um, and then we can lower the sample rate to 192 kilosamples per second, and it becomes low enough that then you can do processing. The other architecture you see these days besides an FPGA to do that kind of processing is a GPU. So they call it GPGPU, general purpose GPU. So you're using your graphics cards to do that because it turns out that the graphics card um, is really designed to do signal processing. It's just doing video signal processing rather than analog signal processing. Because a lot of what you're trying to do in these cases is you're trying to do the same operation to a bunch of samples at once. For example, if I wanna make an amplifier, right? Say I wanna make an amplifier in the software defined radio domain. What's an amplifier? I multiply it by a fixed value, right? To, to have a 6 dB amplitude amplifier, I multiply everything by two because 6 dB is twice. So if I want to do that to a thousand samples, a typical processor, I would have to loop through them, right? And it would execute one instruction per cycle and it would take me a thousand cycles to do that. With a GPU, I have all these little cores that I can tell it, here's your data set. Everybody take a sample everybody multiply it by two and then give me back what it is. Um, so that's also why the FPGA is good because the FPGA can do that sort of parallel processing because it's really a circuit in there. You load up the samples and it has, uh, you know, typical FPGA will have 120 multipliers, right? And you can lay those multipliers out on the board so you can do the multiplication and essentially hardware and you can do it quickly and in parallel. So that's why we use an FPGA and that's why the architectures are there. And that's why a PIC wouldn't be able to do that sorting through data because yeah, it's small and yeah, it's fast because there's not much software on it, but the CPUs are real slow compared to a real, real processor. And you need something really fast to be able to sort through all that data. Even with, let's put it this way, even with two 16 core CPUs inside of our military radio, there's an FPGA in there to lower the data rates before it gets to the processor. So another uh, big thing when you think about like FPGAs, so the, the processor in your computer has to be able to handle all these different instruction sets. It has to be able to multiply, it has to be able to divide. It has to be able to look up memory values and everything. The FPGA, because you are programming the hardware to do one task and that task only, there's no superfluous stuff going on uh, well, depending on, within reason, depending on the limits of the FPGA itself, but you're able to, if you're just doing the multiplication, 
you know, on a, on a CPU, it may take multiple clock cycles for that multiplication because it has to load the instruction. It has to load value A, then value B, and then actually execute the, the multiplication and then store that in a register and yada, yada. And it, it may take it a hundred clocks to actually do a, a simple, you know, number times two, whereas in the FPGA, it, in one clock, it reads in the data and the second clock and multiplies it and third clock, it kicks it out. And then just, and every time you're clocking that, uh, that processor, it is getting the next, everything's just moving through that pipeline so much faster. The thing to remember about an FPGA is you're not, from a software person's perspective, you're not really programming that thing. There is no program that runs on the FPGA. You are writing a definition for hardware um, that is going to be running on there. You are uh, writing something that looks like a program that in eventuality is going to lay out a whole bunch of logic gates that are connected together on a fabric, right? Um, and what for, this is getting a little deep into the programming, but for a programmer, part of what, um, twisted my head and made me realize what was going on is for loops in Verilog. For loops in Verilog cannot have an indeterminate end to them. So you can't break early out of a for loop. You can't add on iterations to a for loop. And I wondered why that was a lot of time until I realized it is because when the Verilog compiler goes through there, it has to know at compile time how many copies of the circuitry you just defined to make, because it is not going to set up a processing loop. It is going to copy the circuitry that the interior of the for loop defines four times or five times or however many times that the for loop creates for it. So it is programmable hardware, but it's not really a program it's a definition about how the hardware looks <laughs> it, it's configurable hardware you yes the configuration you betcha. that you pre-computed uh, earlier on yeah. and once you've done that in that for loop all those different in iterations of the loop all operate at the same time yes that's, that's the real power of nfpga is every gate in the hardware operates on every clock cycle all you at betcha. the same time and that's why almost every design I see for ham radio uses the uh, an FPGA of some sort right now. If you look in the 7300's documentation for ICOM 7300, it is an analog to digital converter hooked up to an FPGA hooked up to a CPU. That's kind of the standard thing that we've settled on. I won't say that, you know, Flex Radio really put out the first commercial radio with that architecture, but, you know, then I'd sound like the Flex Radio sales lady. But. <laughs> Um, Anna, can you comment on um, bandpass filtering to block out things like the local AM radio station and stuff like um, that? Sure. I mean, if you're, we do some bandpass filtering um, to try and knock down some of the. Uh, so it's kind of difficult to explain because it's not as. A lot of architectures will make a big deal about the roofing filters. And I'm not really, I, you know, this is where I wish I had Steve Hicks from Flex to explain this a little bit better. I can't talk about the math um, as well as he can, um, but the one of the weird things that happens with an SDR is that if you run really low signal levels into the ADC, then you don't get a lot of signal in there and you don't get a lot of sample bandwidth, right? If you only get or moving one bit of the ADC, you get a pretty distorted signal out of it. Now, if you actually load that ADC up um, to its full potential and you have a tiny little signal riding on it, due to the filtering and the processing gain and everything, you can actually pull that signal out better in the presence of a strong signal right next to it. Um, so that sort of bandpass and roofing filtering is not as critical for uh, an SDR as it is for an analog radio. That being said, if you have a signal that is strong enough that your ADC is sending ones all, you know, full scale all the time, 
uh, you're not receiving anything either. So you have to have a, a, you know, a good mix of that and know where that proper filtering level is. Um, so we don't really, I'm trying to remember on our radio, the filters are actually settable um, as far as the, and they will do different things depending on what views you're looking at on your radio. And we have software algorithms in the flex that will determine that stuff. One of the things you can see on my screen is that this says wide on the top. Um, because I have so many different bands up, it is switched out to its widest filter right now. Um, and is not uh, it's not filtering as narrow on the bands because I'm looking at three or four different bands at the same time. Um, so you can run into problems. Um, it is not as bad as an analog radio with regard to that. So um, the flex, I can actually, you know, you can actually take those filters out and uh, I can tune the AM bands. A lot of our software engineers use the AM bands as a test. So um, we can receive those and do that sort of stuff. Your antenna probably does some filtering for you by sure, sure. I mean, not, it not is really some things, yeah. You know. I have a friend in the Eugene Club that always gave me a hard time about how now it was time to do software to find antennas. So, um, <laughs> which is kind of some of the stuff that's yeah, coming, know. right? Because um, one of the interesting things that you can do on software to find radio on transmit is called beamforming. So I can take two stationary antennas or four stationary antennas and I can feed them the same signal with phase differences in them. And I can actually steer the beam of the antenna just like a Yagi, except for I'm doing it entirely in software, entirely with phase differences. Um, just like in the, um, one of the things I can set up here that um, doesn't really work on this is um, I can actually turn on diversity mode where I can do two different antennas and the radio will put one antenna in one ear and one in the other. There are also other radios that will automatically pick which is the, the better sample out of those two antennas. Um, the typical use case of that is I can put one antenna being horizontally polarized and another antenna being vertically polarized. And then I can cancel out a lot of QSB um, because QSB is usually due to the phase shift shifting of, as the wave tumbles uh, after being refracted off of the ionosphere. Um, so you can get a lot of uh, uh, reduction in QSB by using two antennas at once. Um, those are restricted to rigs that have two different ADCs in them. Um, some of the flex rigs do and some of the flex rigs don't. Notably, the 6400 only has one ADC in it, so you cannot do diversity with it. I can't speak to um, many other manufacturers rigs. I can speak towards the Apache rigs because they're based on the open HPSDR project um, for which I worked. Uh, I worked on that project for a, a long time. Um, I helped design the uh, network protocol that's used with it. And I wrote Mac OS stuff for it. A lot of those have two ADCs on them now. So, so anyway, uh, more stuff that you can do exclusively with, you know, uh, no, not exclusively, but a lot easier with software to find radio to do some really cool stuff. Uh, another thing on transmit that, that folks are doing that we don't have implemented at Flex yet, we're, we're still looking at implementations and, and being able to do that is called adaptive pre-distortion. So what you do is that you have a sample port on your amplifier and you sample your analog signal into your analog to digital converter. Um, as you're transmitting. And then the radio in software will compare your transmitted signal to the signal that's going into the amplifier. And it will pre-distort the signal going in in order to cancel out this distortion of the amplifier and reduce the IMD on your amplifier going out. And you can literally reduce IMD by 15 to 20 dB by doing adaptive pre-distortion on it which also allows you to do interesting things like make an amplifier that's actually pretty dirty, but it's cheap and light and produces a lot of power for what it is, and then use adaptive pre-distortion to knock down the distortion that's coming out the end of it in order to make it legal to put on the air. So a, a fun story that I, uh, at a, the CubeSat developer conference years ago, <laughs> There was a, a project that uh, 
involved like two satellites on orbit doing some some data and part of their uh part of the thing was they're generating or they knew they're going to generate more data than they could reliably uh downlink in a single uh fm band uh reliably mm -hmm. uh at least the the 12 and a half kilohertz that they were uh normally licensed for so they went in and they got a special uh uh, research uh, grant from the FCC to to use this like really wide mode modulation scheme that would have a insanely high data rate. Uh, the limitation though was they were limited to like a hundred milliwatts or just some fairly low, uh, almost insanely low power, and so they were able to line up uh, two or three dishes in the world uh that they were that were big enough uh and in the right positions to receive their data downlink and they started out with two and one of them right smack dab in the middle of the their uh their downlink frequency was the dispatch frequency for the local ambulance company uh, and their dispatch center was a mile from the dish. So every time the ambulance got dispatched, the, uh, the signal on that uh, being picked up by the 30 meter dish a mile away uh, just drowned out the signal on, on the satellites. And so at the time, uh, that particular dish was running the Edis Research uh, USRP uh, system and so they had you know the the antenna port one was plugged into the to the dish uh and so somebody had the brilliant idea of plugging antenna port two into a paperclip grounding it to the case of the rack and it turns out that it was really handy to have a really bad antenna mm -hmm. that when you have a 200 watt fm signal coming out of of transmitter mile away the paperclip picked up that signal very, very well, uh, and but could not hear anything that was a satellite, and then mm -hmm. just subtract the the signal of the the ambulance of the paperclip from the from the dish, and all of a sudden there they went from uh, I think somewhere in like the you know low ten to twenty percent uh, copy to in the high nineties, uh, and it was all done. Uh, and that was all done in the radio. So they they told the radio what they wanted it to do, and somebody went up uh, once a day and swapped out a hard drive uh, because they didn't have a reliable internet connection to the to the antenna site. And so somebody had to go in and and pull a like a four or five terabyte hard drive once a day and then bring it back to the university to to analyze the data, um, which was one of the really cool things when they were showing off the you know how many hard drives they went through in the mm -hmm. six months they had on the in the first few times in orbit one of the cool things you can do with the again to step into the flex radio sales lady role is that we have some feature called tracking notch filters so you can see um all, that we've got this spur this uh, you know harmonic here from some crap in my house um, the, I can actually put a tracking notch filter on this that will notch that out of the, the signal that I hear. Um, and it will actually keep track of that notch in the radio because likely that's something that is in my house permanently that's not going away. Um, and it every time I go to this band, it will notch out that and it will remember where it is. So even though I, I may uh, drag the band around, it will keep the notch at wherever I put it. Um, so it's kind of a way to notch out permanently some of the local uh, QRN you've got going on. And again, those are features that are, you know, hard to make a, a filter that uh, that just sits there all the time that's dynamic and the bandwidth chain, you know, is adjustable and changeable on an analog radio. Um, it's also something that, I mean, if I look at this guy here, I can actually drag this filter out and you would hear it getting wider. Um, so I can dynamically change the size of my filters to whatever I want them to be. 
Um, and that's all done digitally. It's all in software. So I don't have to install. It's not like a lot of the old CW rigs where you had to install a 500 hertz and, you know, a 50 hertz filter. And, you know, you got all these crystals in a box that you, you swap out and you have four or five of them in the radio at once. I have an infinite number of crystals sitting here that I can filter the the uh, signals however I want, which is really useful for say a contest where maybe I've got somebody that's right above, you know, right on the upper end of the signal. I can actually narrow up my filter and drop them out while still hearing enough of the signal that I want in order to be able to, to copy that uh, and make that QSO. So a really powerful thing to be able to drag your filter widths to essentially whatever you want them to be. Any other questions? I know I'm going off on a lot of things. And again, I'm, I'm sorry if I lost some of you. Uh, I tend to do that sometimes. I have a question, Anna. Yeah, Scott. So you, you've been talking about you know, the RX side of it, um, uh -huh. so the GX side of it. I was just curious, um, is there an issue? Well, how do you deal with um, maybe some digital noise you know, due to the fact that these are um, digital signals? I mean, when you go to, the DAC part of it, you know, you're converting the digital to the analog. Uh -huh. um, it, it's still, when you look at the analog signal, depending on how many bits uh, you have in your KDC or your DAC, mm -hmm. you're going to have, you know, steps in your sine wave, let's say. Sure. Um, which will, of course, you know, um, generate maybe a little bit of digital noise, uh, just, sorry, maybe some harmonics and so forth. Um, and I assume that you know you just use uh, low pass filters to get rid of that stuff. But my uh, and, and then it gets you amplified. Actually, What's that? You actually don't, and that's a common misconception: is that the stair step of the digital signal makes a whole bunch of difference in the noise. As long as you um, adhere to the Nyquist criteria, the signal turns out okay. And really? it's especially in the signals that you're talking about where you're the actual you know, on transmit, the actual bandwidth of your signal is like, I mean, for you, you're a CW operator. The actual bandwidth of your signal is like 50 Hertz. And we are putting that into a part that can do 500 mega samples per second, right? 500 million samples per second. So um, the part is good, but uh, the the old idea, and I know it's counterintuitive, and I know it doesn't make a lot of sense, and it didn't make a lot of sense to me to start out with, but when you look at it, the noise on a signal like that is not created really by the stair step. The noise created on the signal is really created by rounding error in the equations that come through and do it. Oh, interesting. Interesting. Okay, well, thanks for clearing that up. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that yeah. that that sampling noise and issue. That's all of the RF side, mm -hmm. and once you demodulate that down to an audio signal, all that little stuff is all yeah. gone. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that actually happens is um, that's also really weird is that when you start decimating the signal to come down to a sample rate that you can actually hear, like you know forty eight k to go through your sound card you actually get what's called sampling gain on that. So you may start out with a part that's 122 mega samples per second and has like 90 dB of, uh, of dynamic range, but because you decimate that sample so much, you could end up with 130 or 140 dB of dynamic range just by doing the math on it. And that is not fake gain. That's not fake dynamic range you're getting. That is real dynamic range that comes because of the math you're doing and the decimation you're doing on it. It's called sampling gain. It's, it's noise reduction because you're averaging basically. Yep. Well, one thing when, uh, on that note, for both uh, you and Don and Anne, um, uh, if you compare a um, an old um, analog rig to, to an SDR, uh, I mean the quality of the sound or the signal, um, the the signal audio, you'll definitely hear a major difference in signal to noise ratio due to that. Mm -hmm. I think. Yeah. Um, so the SDR, uh, whereas on an analog strictly analog rig, you will hear you'll hear a signal. I'm talking about, say, a sideband signal, uh, and you can barely pick it out. Uh, with the SDR, you really hear that uh, very clearly. Yep. I've, I've experienced that many times. Yep. 
there are a lot you of guys i gotta bail out but uh, thank you so much for the presentation it's nice seeing you again after uh, such a long time thanks bill your audio is like Two thousand percent better. Yeah, yeah. I I figured out what was wrong. <laughs> Thanks, so, Anna. Bill. Anna, I just, uh, just wanted to make a comment sure. that I felt like your explanations. I could still follow them all. Good. Uh, even though I'm not at the same level Don is, <laughs> um, <laughs> that's maybe a hard hard one to reach. Um, your explanation. Sounds like I'm not either. So <laughs> we're very good. Good for uh, well focused. Thank you so much, Betsy. Yeah, that's really what I strive for is to you know try and teach folks some of the joy of the technical side of ham radio and kind of how things work and how things are built because I think it's important. Yeah. Well, I uh, never lack for somebody trying to teach me about technical stuff. <laughs> <laughs> any other questions or comments or you know i'm happy to answer flex radio questions too although mike wants me to do an intro to flex radio presentation i i didn't do it this time because i don't really have a presentation written up and i'm struggling a little bit with um uh, you know I love where I work, but I really don't want to sound like the incessant flex sales lady that's trying to sell you something um, because that's not really my point. Um, my point is I'm really proud of my company and what we do. And I think we make an awesome product, but um, I, I don't want to come in here and, and sound like it's the sales presentation. Although I would be happy for you guys to all buy flex radios because I think they're awesome. One of these days. <laughs> well, yeah, you know, you kind of need to cash out your 401k and stuff in order to be able to afford it, but you know, it, it is what it is. Well, maybe in LC, if we get a, a nice big grant, that would help. <laughs> well, speaking of grants, I guess I should, this is completely off topic, but I should mention this to folks that may not be aware of it. Um, there is a, an organization called the uh, ARDC, the Amateur Radio Development Corporation, and they are out there and uh, uh, because they are the folks that had the foresight to get the Ampernet internet address space like 25 years ago, the 44 net. Um, they recently, uh, because they saw the writing on the wall with uh, regards to um, the IPv4 situation about addressing and where that market was going and looked at how much amateur radio actually used, they sold off a bunch of it to um, Amazon for, you know, in the, the mid tens of millions of dollars. So they now have literally millions of dollars in a nonprofit organization whose mission is to give grants to amateur radio projects that are worthy of stuff. Um, and they have done everything from, I mean, the Hamwin uh, implementation in Portland got like $50,000. Um, and I know some people that are on the, uh, I know, actually know the chair of the grants board. He's one of my friends in Seattle area. Um, I know another guy that's on the grants board because he's one of my friends in the Seattle area too. Um, and I have heard from them that they, they're, the structure of the company is such that they must give away a certain percentage of their um, income off of the investment every year. Otherwise they get in trouble with the IRS. So they are looking for grants. The other thing that you should keep in mind if you're looking for grants for them is um, John has told me specifically that it takes just as much time for them to vet a $1,000 grant as it does a $10,000 grant. So don't think that you need to ask for a tiny amount of money in order to get through. That is not true whatsoever. And they've done everything from um, I read one grant uh, gave a uh, money to buy a satellite downlink station for the ISS to a children's museum in New York State. 
Um, one of them gave uh, a grant to put up a whole bunch of wind link stations for a uh, an emergency services organization in Texas. Like I say, there's Portland Hamwan that got a bunch of money to actually go and buy space at high sites around Portland to put wireless gear on as well as the wireless gear expenses. So if you have projects that you think are worthy for the ham community, um, and it's not only doing you know emergency services and infrastructure projects, Projects. I know there is a grant out there for the Tangerine SDR, um, which is a new um, SDR that's uh, experimental SDR out there that's actually being used by the HamSci folks to do science with and stuff like that. Um, they made a grant to um, rehabilitate the satellite antenna on top of one of MIT's buildings that belongs to the MIT Amateur Radio Club. So don't be afraid to use that channel. They have um, a bunch of documentation on there for grants that have been successful and to show you what those people um, did to uh, get those grants and the paperwork that they submitted. Um, and they actually employ somebody whose job it is to help organizations get grants from ARDC. So um, anyway, if people have projects that you're looking for um, that are worthy to do that with, then um, that may be a source of money um, that folks can get stuff from. Great. That may not have as many strings as trying to go to, um, you know, Homeland Security or somebody like that to get that. Yeah, there was a blurb about the ARDC grants. Um, I think in one of the uh, AWRL newsletters, mm -hmm. newsletters, and uh, I sent that uh, copy to our grant writing lady, so she Good. was going to look into it. So yeah, definitely have her apply. They are look actively looking for people. They need to give away money. They want people to put in grants. So you have a relatively high chance of success, especially if you have a grant writing rate just looking at it. You, you, I'm, I swear, you could probably get five to $10,000 pretty easily out of them right now. Okay. They need yeah. to give away the money. Okay, thanks for that. Yeah. yeah. Um, and if you need pointers to people, let me know. Like I say, I know people that are involved, so. Okay, thank you. Anybody else with software defined radio questions as I've derailed things? <laughs> all right, thanks everybody. I will turn off the sharing now. You don't need to see all my bands. If I can figure out how to do it, there's a stop sharing somewhere. There we go. All right. Well, so you get you somebody much. at least better looking than Mike this time. So, you know, there is. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> thank you, Anna. Yeah, thank you. So, oh, one, well, I have one question. Maybe you probably can't. I don't know if you know the answer to this, but you might. Um, would I, I've seen a couple of um, like AM FM type radio. Uh, uh, I can't remember the brands, but they they tout that they're STR. Mm -hmm. neighbors, you know, um, which kind of makes sense. Uh, do you see? I mean. You know, so there, there's kind of a debate going on saying well, radio's dead. No, radio is not dead. Uh, on the radio is not dead side, do you see everything going to SCR eventually and getting rid of pretty much all the old analog transistor radio type of things? And is there a market uh, for that still? I Yeah, I, I think that most things are going to go digital because there are so many advantages. I mean, just like everything else, right? I mean, TV is digital now. I mean, there are so many advantages of doing... Um, even uh, doing radio digitally. And I kind of have to laugh um, being an implementer of this stuff all the time because the I swear the hardest mode for us to implement in a Flex 6000 is not sideband, it is CW. CW presents us the most problems with implementing it and it all has to do with latency and um, how latency works when you're trying to do the signal process that is true. things like yeah. that. that is so that is the Achilles heel of a lot of the SDR architectures if they don't do things uh, correctly, which we have our, you know, I will, I am a flex sales lady, but I, I admit the truth. And we had to have some issues with some of our CW processing that we need to work through. But, um, uh, but I mean, even HF, I will, I will tell you this, HF radio is making a comeback. Um, and it's really, really interesting to me working for Flex because um, most of the traditional HF companies have honestly forgotten how to do HF. So Collins, 
Collins doesn't know how to do HF anymore. I mean, there was a time when Collins was the radio company. If you wanted to do anything HF, you wanted a Collins S line in the seventies, right? Um, they have forgotten how to do HF and they've forgotten how to do HF so much that they want flex radio to manufacture radios for them because we're the ones becoming the ones in the government and commercial sector that know how to do HF radio, both on the radio side and the amplifier side. We're doing some amplifier projects that I can't talk very much about for some big radio companies um, to sell into the government and the military. So HF radio is making a comeback because they're realizing that our enemies can shoot down satellites. It's pretty hard for them to shoot down the ionosphere. Okay, there you go. So I guess that the HF, uh, UHF markets, uh, not just for him, but also for, uh, I guess, government and you know, obviously police and public service mm -hmm. are all going direction uh, digital as well, I would assume. Oh yeah, well, I mean, all the police and fire and public service are going to, um, digital modulation schemes where they're like on DMR or P25 or something like that. And doing all those digital modes is a whole lot easier um, with a software defined radio than it is uh, on trying to interface that digital stuff to analog. You can actually implement all that stuff in software. And let's say you can make a radio that with a software upgrade can speak P25 one day and DMR the next and D star after that, right? Because all it is is a software load the radio becomes generic. It's interesting. All right. All right, well, thank you very much. And thanks everybody for uh, coming out and doing the Zoom thing one more time. Yeah. I think we're almost getting used to doing this again. Unfortunately. <laughs> hey, Carol. Thanks for listening yeah. to me blather on. Take All care. Right. Thank you for blathering. <laughs> yeah, it was great. We, we, I think we all really enjoyed it. Take care. Have a good night, all. <laughs>